Okay, hi everyone, and welcome to CEPR. Uh, it's good to see, uh, see, see many of you here, and I'm really looking forward to seeing many more of you uh, join us in just 16 days for our uh, economic summit. Uh, today, though we're in for a real treat, we have a guest speaker from the front lines of economic policy making uh, with us for today's associates meeting. Uh, Dr. Tom Honig is the Vice Chairman of the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which provides insurance to depositors in U.S. banks along with multiple uh, regulatory functions. Uh, the FDIC provides insurance to, I believe, 5,200, is that the 5,700, 5, 5,700 different financial institutions. So. That makes for a very busy agenda and gives Dr. Honig a very clear view of how things are going on in the banking industry. Uh, the FDIC was the product of the 1933 Banking Act uh, 85 years ago and was meant to ensure bank deposits and restore faith in the banks uh, during the Great Depression. Uh, nowadays, the FDIC doesn't necessarily make a ton of headlines. Um, nor does its vice uh, chair try to, though you will find from time to time him in the headlines with uh, leading outlets like the Wall Street Journal, FDIC's Honig keeps Wall Street on edge. Uh, so uh, consistent with this, and we'll hear more about that today, uh, Dr. Honig was in the news earlier this year when he sent a letter to the Senate Banking Committee warning about a few provisions in a bill aimed at easing banking rules. Uh, he signaled some concern over language that would exempt smaller banks from the Volcker rule that bans proprietary trading and would then encourage those banks potentially to take on more risk. He told lawmakers that certain sections of the bill would, quote, remove important safeguards that could jeopardize the strides we have made towards stable long-term economic growth. Uh, his concern for uh, uh, smart banking regulation is certainly nothing new. Uh, in 2009, when he was the president of the Kansas City Federal Reserve, uh, he gave a harsh assessment of the government's handling of the upheaval among financial institutions during the financial crisis. He criticized authorities for being too quick to bail out struggling firms and not having a clear plan to address some of the underlying problems that led to their troubles. Uh, he's actually been at the FDIC since 2012, six years, uh, when he was elected to serve as the agency's vice chairman and board member. And prior to that, he had been running the Kansas City Fed as its president for 20 years uh, and served uh, for much of that time on the Federal Open Market Committee. Uh, Tom had been with the Federal Re Federal Reserve for a total of 38 years, 38 years with the Federal Reserve, starting out as an economist and then as a senior offer in banking supervisions during the country's banking crisis in the 1980s. In 1986, he led the Kansas City Fed's Division of Bank Supervision and Structure, where he directed the oversight of more than 1,000 banks and bank holding companies with assets up to $20 billion, and they made him president there in 1991. Uh, long before he became involved in banking regulations and setting monetary policy, uh, Dr. Honig received a doctorate in economics in his home state from Iowa State University. And I'll just say that in uh, next week in my Econ 1 class, I am covering financial regulation. So if you see me furiously scribbling down notes during today's session, you now know why. So with that, uh, I'm so grateful. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Honig with us here to CEPR. And we're delighted to, to welcome you. Well, thank you, Mark. Thank you for inviting me here. I <clears throat> told some, some of you that it was really a hard trip. I left an ice storm in Kansas City to be here with you today, and that was quite a sacrifice on my part. Um, but I am, I am pleased to be here, and I, I am going to talk about uh, some of the issues around the, the safety net today. But I want, to, I want to accomplish two or three things. Uh, I want to acknowledge that uh, right now there is a a reemergence of the discussion, perhaps the debate, around banking regulation and supervision. And I'm going to share some of my perspective on that. But I want to set the context, and that is um, I am uh, certainly in favor of some of the need for regulatory relief. The banking industry is one of the most heavily regulated industries in the country. It's also one of the most heavily subsidized industries, and therein lies some of the conflict. Um, but I want to I set it up by acknowledging right now the economy, then talk about the 
the issues around regulatory relief, and I want to distinguish between what I think is of I think of as prudential regulation supervision versus administrative. And I think there's more opportunity for some pretty substantial relief on the administrative side. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Let me set it up because I want to acknowledge that uh, the U.S. economy right now is in a, a almost like a boom uh, in terms of the economic activity with the stock market rising, incomes rising. Um, we're seeing our GDP this year is projected to be uh, a, around 2.8, close to 3%, which will be a, a, a very significant increase uh, over the more recent years uh, since the, the last crisis. <clears throat> Unemployment is around 4%. Uh, and we have, I think, uh, a very strong economy there. Industrial production's up. Every component of GDP, consumption, investment, government spending, looks like it will be up. Fiscal policy is very stimulative in terms of the tax cuts. The drag is our uh, uh, external sector. Uh, and that even is a sign of a strong economy because it's a growing deficit due to our consumption of other goods overseas. So we have a very good economy. And in that environment, there is an increasing appetite for risk uh, among uh, our banks as well as other industries, uh, and I recognize that. <clears throat> and around that appetite for risk is a very strong desire to remove some of the regulatory uh, burden or requirements uh, of the industry, and I understand that as well. <clears throat> so what I want to do is I want to say, there, when I think about it, I look at regulation from the point of view of prudential regulation versus um, administrative. And by prudential, I mean two basic elements. One is capital, the true owner capital, that is the source of funding that comes from the investors that can be used, lent out, uh, uh, loaned out, and so forth. And the fact that we need sufficient capital so that the ownership sector uh, does some of the disciplining of the firm up front. The second prudential element that I want to talk about is uh, around the idea of how broadly you extend the safety net, deposit insurance, the liquidity backup that the Federal Reserve gives, the guarantees that go with that, from what was traditionally commercial bank into broker-dealer activities, investment banking, and so forth, and why that, I think, is important. In contrast to that is the administrative issues, some things that I'll talk about, living wills, resolution plans, uh, things that are required under the law that I think are less productive, but substitute for prudential supervision. So that's part of it. In the first slide, if I can get this right, um, this is kind of the history of the, um, what I'll call the subsidy or the support for the industry. Uh, it is, shows that the uh, amount of capital, ownership capital, the tangible capital that absorbs loss from the owners, a systematic de decline. And coincidentally, that lines up pretty well with increases of the safety net. The Federal Reserve formed in 1913, actually the control of the currency in 1863, 64, then the forming of the, of the Federal Reserve, and then deposit insurance for retail depositors. So as those safety net came forward and the market demanded less of these institutions, uh, the subsidy grew and banks were able to increase their debt as a source of funds versus their equity. And I think that is a very substantial benefit to the industry. It allowed them to uh, lever and to at least temporarily boost their returns for the industry. So as that declined and the subsidy grew, the industry became more vulnerable accordingly. If you look at then at the next graph, which is, is the crisis year, that when you look at the losses in 2008 plus the uh, so-called uh, uh, equity that provided by the government known as TARP, um, the losses were about equal to, the, uh, to about 6% of assets. But when you looked at that graph earlier, the one that I just showed you, you'll see that the tangible capital, the ownership equity, was closer to 3%. So no wonder we had a lack of confidence. Losses were mounting faster than the equity, and the government had to step in. So let's remember that as we go forward uh, from here. 
Um, that leads us then to the other element, and that was a consolidation of the industry, which has continued uh, past the crisis, but certainly to the crisis. We had a long period of very stable uh, conditions, and the industry, I think, very successfully lobbied for allowing them to engage in more activities, to use the commercial bank and let them get into other activities like investment banking, broker-dealer activities, and, uh, and so forth in the bank. And there, that grew. And so the, the growth of the industry, uh, there was major acquisitions of uh, some of the investment firms uh, before and after the crisis. It actually got even more so. And we see that in the growth of the non-bank or the concentration of the industry overall. And I think that is important to realize. So when we had then the crisis came the correction, right? And the, the main parts of that were in the so-called Dodd-Frank Act. The, the, the important thing to remember there was two prudential standards that I think are very important. One, there was more emphasis on using ownership equity or capital to absorb the loss versus the, the, the low capital ratios and the government standing behind it in terms of the safety net. And we saw that uh, in improvements in capital, which I'll show you in a second. The second was a narrowing to some extent of the use of the safety net, that is the Federal Reserve's liquidity facility and the, Federal, and the FDIC's uh, insurance facility to underwrite or uh, sub, uh, be um, part of the support for uh, these uh, commercial banks that were engaged in, number one, uh, some of the broker-dealer activities and some of the ownership of hedge funds that were allowed uh, earlier in that decade. So there was a correction called the Volcker Rule, the limited proprietary trading and, and the use of insured funds to invest in and own or support uh, hedge fund activities. Uh, you saw the improvements then. The capital ratios of these institutions have improved uh, from as low as 3 and 2% to 5 and 6 and even 8% in one instance. So capital was strengthened. And that, I think, is a very substantial improvement. Now, as they limited the activities, as capital improved, the subsidy still remained. It was less, but it still remained. And that you can see in this slide here. So prior to the um, issuance of the safety, or the growth of the safety net, banks were holding 10 to 12% tangible equity, that investor sources of funds, to assets. And if we were to require that today, just 10%, it was more than that, but if we were to require that today, 10%, what this shows is that they would have to own, that the top 10 banks would have to have about a trillion four, a little more than a trillion four of capital. They have about a trillion dollars of tangible capital. That means 400, over $400 billion dollars is implied backstop that the taxpayer provides, right? Because if we're going to bail them out with TARP, we're going to bail them out with TARP, right? So that's really part of what's going on there. They're able to lever more. They get a higher ROE. The investors are happy. And the, the, the safety net is behind it. And that is part of the subsidy that continues that I think is important. The other is their footprint. It's larger than ever. Now, by this I mean the following. It's not just the assets they have on their balance sheet, okay? It's the assets they have on their balance sheet, the derivatives that are off balance sheet but on fair value add substantially to their balance sheet. The, the next is the amount of trust assets they hold, so they have that influence. And the final is the amount of, of, of um, safekeeping they do for others. So if they post collateral, they hold the collateral, they can uh, lend that collateral temporarily, and that's all part of, the, of what they touch, and it's substantial. As you can see, for the largest four, it's larger in terms of what they touch compared to the GDP, which tells me that too big to fail remains with us uh, very much the case. There is no Secretary of Treasury that I can think of. And, and, and I think of myself as fairly 
you know, I would like to see the market discipline come forward, but if I were in that position and one of them was going down, I'd say, bail them out. I don't want to be on my watch that we have that kind of a failure. And that's really part of the continuing of the too big to fail subsidy that's going forward. So prudential standards are capital and limiting the extension of the safety net to other activities, especially prop trading and high risk activities. Let that be outside of the commercial bank. Now, the argument back right now, especially given that things are really doing well in the economy, is that those kinds of capital requirements that you're asking for, Tom, of 10% or higher, and those limiting those activities to more traditional act commercial banking activities is impeding growth. But if you look at that, <clears throat> uh, let me tell you, if you have marginal capital, and this shows the, the trend of, of lending through the cycle, the banks that had the least amount of capital were the ones that withdrew the, the lending most quickly. And uh, as was told in my region, uh, why should I save you? I've got, to, I've got to worry about myself. And the loans were pulled. So you had that going on. And that's true. Better capitalized banks were able to support through the cycle. The same for smaller banks. Also then, by limiting having the Volcker rule in that trading, it limited the lending for, for uh, the, the ability to have loans for, for trading activities under the Volcker rule. But since the crisis, lending has continued to go up. There's been no imp significant impediment to trading activities. And I think that's very important to note in both cases. Uh, same thing with the, the spreads. All right, so it's not that the pricing is so much that we're pricing them out of the market. They're still very competitive, able to provide that. So that's really the point. So now that's the last of the slides, but that doesn't mean that there is an opportunity for true reg relief. For example, if you have the, the, the amount of capital, the idea of resolution, let's talk about that for a minute. In the Dodd-Frank Act, the FDIC and the Fed, we are require of all the largest banks a resolution plan. It's hundreds, thousands of pages that I think is an exercise in um, paper pushing, all right? Because you cannot solve the issue of cross-border uh, issues with the largest institutions uh, through the resolution plan. They're there. You will ring fence the day the problems start. So we can write this stuff down. We can talk about triggers for, the, for a crisis and what are you going to do? How long is your liquidity going to last? But the fact of the matter is it's, not, it's, it's an issue that will never, ever evolve the way you plan it in the resolution. So we're, we're generating tremendous fees for consultants. Uh, but not much in terms of solutions. The stress tests. I, I love the stress tests. Uh, I think banks should do them. But when we set up models, and the whole idea of the industry is to find out what the model is so we can game it. And, and, they, and it's normal. But it's, it's expensive, and it doesn't accomplish a lot. So let's eliminate that. Let's simplify it. Let's get, get that out of the way. We have other things that, that, that they're using. And one of them is... Uh, Total loss absorbing capital. It's using debt in the parent. It's a very expensive exercise. They have to put the debt in. It's assumed to go down. But the fact of the matter is, if you have a crisis, the supervisor has to make a hard choice. Do I let them go into default because the bank needs the capital, or do I let them pay the dividends up to cover it so it doesn't go in default so that things remain stable? I, I guarantee you that it, there'll be a bailout to make sure that doesn't have to be called. So that's another opportunity. Liquidity rules. If you have the right amount of capital, that's a very strong source of liquidity. It's a source of confidence. And so we have a very arcane liquidity rules that um, I assure you, as we go through the cycle and the crisis, will serve no useful purpose other than to cause a furtherance of the crisis itself. So these are the sorts of things, what I call the administrative burden of developing lots of plans, lots of paperwork, but very little else that should be eliminated. And focus on the prudential standards. Yes, let's argue about that. Is 10% enough or not? I think it is, but let's focus on that. And let's limit the amount of the safety net and how far we extend it 
And I think we'll all be off better. So my point is simple. We are now in a time where the economy is strongest. The arguments for deregulation will be hard to uh, argue against because the crisis is forgotten by many and times are good and we want to use leverage to our own advantage. But we ought to think about it. Let's focus on keeping the prudential standards and let's finally get rid, if we're going to get rid of something, get rid of the administrative stuff that costs a lot of money and produces very little. And I think we'll have a better banking system. Uh, the last thing I will tell you is because we have insisted on stronger capital, I think we are the most successful banking system in the world. Europe doesn't compare to us. Uh, I hate to tell you, if you're from Europe, we have a much stronger, we're taking market share, and that's from strength, not from competing to the bottom, but from strength. So I'm going to stop there. I know that uh, some of you may disagree with me. I, I can't imagine why, but it could happen. And I'm happy to take your questions or your comments. Thank you. Well, I'm happy to hear that we are doing better than Europe on this metric because they are sort of crushing us right now in the Olympics. So uh, it has been, <laughs> you the medal count, it's, uh, it's not very close. So anyway, but, but we've got them on banking regulation. Yep. So you talked about how, so, and I'm going to ask a few questions about the banking regulation and then perhaps a bit on monetary policy sure. and then open it up for others here who have much more expertise in this space uh, than I do. But when you look out at the world right now, you talked about the economy is very strong, 4% uh, unemployment, S&P 500 is up about 31% yeah. over the last 15 or so months. It's been, you know, things have been going very well. And in your sector, in the banking sector, the return has been even higher, mm -hmm. sort of 70-ish percent, <clears throat> depending on how exactly you define things. So. At a high level, it sounds like to you things look good, but I'm interested to hear your sense of vulnerability. Are we more vulnerable now than we were, let's say, 11 years ago, 2007, February of 2007? And if so, why? Or if, and maybe, it's, maybe there's some things go one way, some things go the other way. But. Uh, good question. I think we're, I mean, we are, we are stronger today than we were 11 years ago relative to the capital numbers that I showed you relative to the types of assets that we have on our books right now. Uh, I, think we're, I think we're less vulnerable. However, uh, I like to tell people, given my years in supervision, that right now we're making all our mistakes, right? Because right now things are very good. We have an appetite for risk. We want that, but that's probably where we're going. To, we're sowing the seeds. I don't know where they are, whether it's in leverage lending, uh, collateralized loan obligations, we don't know. And as someone said, you won't know until it breaks because if you fight the last war, you're going to get surprised by where the, where the uh, enemy outflanks you. So I think we're, we're better able to absorb a shock than we were then, uh, but I don't take that for granted because if you had 6% losses and 6% capital, your, your market's going to lose confidence. So... Uh, and other things may cause it, but certainly that won't be a help. Right. So uh, one of the things that in the, in the banking sector, there's really good data <clears throat> put out by the Fed, by FDIC and others, so that you can get a sense of how different players are growing over time. My sense is that some of the biggest banks have gotten differentially, have grown more rapidly than the sector as a whole, so that one could argue the market is becoming somewhat more concentrated. The, the, the bigger banks are, are, are becoming larger. And when you sort of think about the, the sector and this too big to fail kind of, kind of issue, what, how, there's this question in industrial organization of how many competitors is the right number. Is right. two enough? Is four enough? Is eight, 15, and what have you? So I'm curious how you think about this in the banking sector. We've got hundreds and hundreds of banks. Really, the top five are pretty dominant, right? So perhaps you can. Well, I, I mean, we are not as concentrated as other countries, but that's, of course, not the definition of whether you're concentrated too much or not. And I think I, I, we've become rapidly more concentrated in this country in the last two decades. Um, we have, you know, the largest, the largest 10 banks at one point had like 
and don't hold me to these numbers, but something like 20% now, it's over 50% and growing. So we are becoming more concentrated. Our, our market structures change. We used to have restrictions on interstate banking. That's gone away. So some of that's to be expected. Um, I do think the, the thing that bothers me is when you then look at how much of the financial industry is touched and influenced by these, it's, it's enormous. Uh, does that mean they're not competitive? They probably are very competitive with one another. Um, but I, it also means that if any of them do get in trouble, we will have major problems. So it's not, it's not just is it concentrated to where they're able to uh, uh, extract rent. Uh, I, I doubt that we're at that point yet, uh, but the research would have to be the thing to tell us on that uh, because this is a fairly recent phenomenon, this kind of concentration. But we are clearly uh, subject to any one of them getting into trouble, uh, which would take uh, government intervention. Uh, I think at one time, even 30 years ago, less so. Uh, but we did bail out Continental to some degree, didn't right, we? Right, right. Yeah. And, and so one of the things that influences policy is politics. And so I'm curious if in banking regulation today and in recent years, has the politics of banking regulation been a sort of straight, you know, if you're on one side, you favor less regulation. If you're on the other side, you favor more. Or is it somewhat more nuanced than that? Are there certain regulations that seem to have more bipartisan support or l less support across the board? Well, I think it, I don't think it's that different than other industries. You have those who are very, uh, like I say, very administratively oriented, we'll manage from the top and we'll make sure they do the right thing and loan to the right, and I think that's probably harmful. At the same time, I think uh, people who argue it's a free market, I think they're mis misleading themselves, uh, if not the, more broadly, because you can't have this size of, of, uh, of a subsidy and consider it free market. Uh, so that's why I, I've argued that Let's focus on prudential standards. Uh, I don't think at this stage even they would stop a systemic event from taking place, but it would uh, internalize the subsidy uh, to where it's not as generous as it otherwise would be. And I think that's where we ought to concentrate. I, I did propose simplifying the structure. I, you know, I, let's, let's force a broker-dealer out. Let's set up a separate organization where that could fail and not bring down the bank, but that has, there's no appetite for that you know, in this country. So that means we are going to have these institutions. They are going to continue to be dominant. I think they're going to grow even more so in time. For, for right now, there's, you, know, you don't see the merger activity even for them to the next year down, but I think that's a matter of time. They're still, you know, not everyone has forgotten the crisis of 2008. Not everyone is happy that we have these large institutions. So that's, that's holding it back. But they have a significant advantage over others. That is, the, the, the tier of commercial banks, the re super regionals and regionals, have about 200 basis points more in, tan in ownership equity tangible than the largest. That is a nice competitive advantage and lower cost of capital to the largest institutions, which means they'll win the game. And so when that opens up, I think they'll be in a position to acquire, and I think they will. I think we'll see further concentration. I don't know when it's too much, uh, but I do worry that it may, we may kind of drift that way over time. Okay, so I've got one more on banking regulation than a couple on monetary policy. And so others, I hope, will think of questions uh, 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 during the time. But on the f banking regulation, so FDIC derives a fair amount of their revenues from premiums, Correct. right, for this insurance yes. from banks. And that insurance, banks are paying for it in the event that things go south, and then that would provide insurance to their depositors up right. to $250,000 right. per depositor. <clears throat> Is it your sense that that relationship between the price of the insurance and the risk that the bank is taking on influences their behavior to a significant extent? Because one of the things would be have that risk-based pricing so that banks don't push the envelope too much on risk. Is, that, do you, is it your sense that, that I just don't have a sense of, or have the formula for it and how, how it works? Well, 
let me first start. There, there were many years where the, the FDIC's insurance was a flat rate. Right, for everybody, and, same rate. Yeah, same rate. So there was no, no deterrent to risk taking. In fact, those who would be safer were subsidizing those who were less safe. Right. Uh, in recent years, uh, we have been given the authority to risk base our, our premiums. And we've begun to do that. And we have, we have a, 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 a pricing mechanism for the very largest and a pricing mechanism for all others because of the difference in the breadth of activities. <clears throat> now, we are, uh, that is a very, we, we don't just change, we're not a, an insurance company can just change price when we see the risk go up. We have to go through a notice of rulemaking and all that, and that becomes, by the time we get the price changed, the whole risk, <laughs> whole risk <laughs> framework has changed. Uh, so it's slow and cumbersome, but it's better than nothing. And, but I don't think it's had much of an impact on the risk appetite. I don't think it's, I think the subsidy is just still too rich. Uh, now, over time, that may, I hope, change, but I don't see it happening very quickly. I'm pretty sure that if you, FDIC, had a bunch of data from before risk-based pricing to after, and with data on the banks, and you wanted someone to analyze it, that we at CEPR could help <laughs> you out with that. So just let us know if you need to see whether it did move the needle and if policy could be better, because well, that's kind of what we do. Yeah, and as we collect data, because this is fairly new, this, the level of pricing that we've been able to do, we've had it for a while, but, but we've only more recently gotten the, the ability to, to, to be more uh, intense in our pricing. Right. Uh, and so it'll take a while to get the data. But yeah, I'd, I'd love, to, I'd love to know the answer. If it make it, how do you, you know, how do you know when you got it right? And right. We, we, we're guessing right now. There's no That's what we do at CEPR. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. So, uh, <laughs> I, got, I got the message. Take a note. <laughs> uh, so on monetary policy. Sure. So I looked right before coming down here, 2.95% is the 10-year rate. <clears throat> it's quite a bit higher than it was sure. <clears throat> many months ago. Um, so I'm curious to hear your thoughts on recent changes in monetary policy. I, I mentioned to you earlier, I think it was... 13 months and two days ago, we had Janet Yellen through here. John Taylor was right there. And 12 days later, the sure Fed, raised, here today. Fed, raised, <laughs> Fed raised interest rates. And that, that's, that's also what we do. But, but, uh, but so I'm curious, your thinking on the pace of the recent rate increases. You have a lot of experience on the FOMC. I do. Yeah. And, and then, uh, so maybe you can talk a little bit about what you've seen over the past year, year and a half. And what, what, what do you think lies ahead? Okay. Well, just thank you. I, I'm happy to answer that. Let me first give context. I, I was known as a, um, uh, I opposed the movement. I, when we were in the crisis, I was very much for putting the liquidity into the system. I didn't think we had any choice. But when the, the recovery started in late, in the third quarter of 2009, I said, let's start tapering back back then. So we don't get down to zero and quantitative easing because I think once you set an equilibrium around zero and, and you put all the expectations around that, you have a new equilibrium even though it may be unstable. And so, but we went ahead and did it. So now we had this long period of near zero interest rates with a balance sheet that's been enormous, four trillion from less than a trillion. Uh, so, so there we are. So people said, well, now you would expect, you would want them to move quickly. And I, I said, no, you don't. Once you get an equilibrium, you don't shock your economy out of it without creating the very crisis that you were trying to, to uh, avoid. So I, I think uh, Janet uh, and the FOMC uh, have done a pretty darn good job of it. Uh, now, you can debate whether they ought to have been a little more insistent in 2016. I'll let you argue that. But since then, I think they've been, you have to be careful. I think you have to bring it slowly out. You're going to let your balance sheet kind of roll off. I think that's the right policy. And I think uh, they're going to have some, the, the tough calls are ahead because if inflation moves up uh, and they're doing this gradually, then they're going to say, I'm a behind the curve. If I, if I move too quickly, will I put us into a spin? Uh, that'll stop the inflation, but also... Uh, hurt a lot of asset values, and there'll be consequences to that. So they have some really tough decisions. I think at this point, their gradual approach, which I suspect uh, 
Jay Powell, the new chair, will follow. I don't know that, but I suspect he will. Uh, is is the right policy. You've got an economy that's got to adjust gingerly, in my opinion. Otherwise, you will pay dearly. I mean, consistent with that, if you look at the trajectory of the Fed's balance sheet, yep. sort of 700, 800, 900 billion before the crisis, then up over 4 trillion, right. but it's stayed pretty flat. It has right. not been sort of falling at a, but you think that that is a good to take that very slowly. I think they're gonna, they're gonna roll that off very slowly because it's, it's a form of tightening. There's no question because who's gonna, especially if, you're, if your deficit is gonna grow, the supply is gonna be up so the interest rate should rise. How much of that, how much can you afford to absorb? Those will all be questions that they have to think about. And if you're rolling your, if you're shrinking your balance sheet more rapidly when that environment what are the consequences of that? I know they're studying that. I don't know what their answers are right now, obviously. But those are the sorts of things that got to be entering the, the, the picture big time right now. OK, so my last question before opening up for you is uh, when you look out at the economy generally, financial sector specifically, what are you most worried about? I th I th I'm <laughs> this is going to sound trite, but I'm worried about the 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 assets that are being placed on the books of banks that are going to be future problems. Because as I say, as the, as the risk appetite grows, I've seen some of the, in the, in the regionals in the smaller banks, the commercial real estate is now Katie bar the door. Okay, it's very, very substantial. In the largest, you see some of the leverage lending uh, back in, some of the other activities, uh, you know, there's a, 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 a what I'll call a court debate on uh, collateralized loan obligations. They're different than collateralized debt obligations. Uh, you don't have to have retention rules, risk retention rules, originate to distribute. What are they doing? Who's going to buy it? Where's it going to be placed? And how much liquidity is I going to demand at some point? I don't know the answer to those. Uh, that's why those are the sorts of things that I follow and worry about. Uh, but at this stage, as always, I worry about them, but I'm not doing anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> OK, with that, let me open it up for questions from our audience. Uh, let's start back here, Jim. Jim. Sure. There. With respect to the supervisory function over time, where you analyze according to CAMEL ratings plus risk, has that got better or worse since 2008? And do you see more ban? My impression is, a lot of banks are put in the top category, number one now, like never before. Yeah. Um, the examination process is, is, is a, an interesting one. Um, the way we examine regional banks and smaller banks is fairly intense. We do, uh, uh, we, we, it's surprisingly intense uh, in some ways because we do look at their assets. Uh, we do mark down some of the, practices and so forth. The largest, the very largest, we do um, a little more under the stress test method. And that probably, and we have people on site, that's probably a little more of a guessing game, even though they say it's very intense, you look at all this material. But we don't, we don't test the systems uh, as intensely as we do the smaller ones. So I think there we could find ourselves surprised more likely to find herself surprised than not surprised at some future point. That's where management is the key. I hope they're doing a really good job. We're testing it. It gives us some, some sense of confidence, but uh, it's, um, it's more, it's, it's, it's le I have less confidence in it than I wish I could have. I am a little worried about it. So. Okay, Jeanette. Hi. Um, so one of the things in 2008 that I remember is, or actually prior to 2008, was the, um, the, the concern about the, what I'm going to call the non-banking banking industry. And uh, that comprised Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, yeah. others who are now banks. Yeah. Against their best, against against their what they wanted to do, but they got folded in, right? Yeah. Um, 
I suspect in this audience, a lot of people on the financial footprint picture were surprised to see State Street so large. Uh, I think that must be because of the custodium. Yes, yes, okay, absolutely. Activities. So whether, it, but you're not putting fidelity up there, for example. Right. Um, so whether it's fidelity or whether it's crowdsourcing via Bitcoin, um, how worried are you about the non-bank banking sector that you're not really regulating? Yeah. I, I, it's a very good question, and, and my answer to that is I, I, I probably be, should be more worried than I am, but there, there you're investing, and in, the investor knows you know, that it's going to be marked down on a daily basis. They understand the risk better, uh, and, or, or at least they should understand the risk better, and I think that's a pretty good discipline on, on how they operate especially with operational risk. Um, State Street was a custodian. It was using its custodial assets to rehypothecate, and we were lending 60 to $90 billion a day during that crisis. So they, they were really influenced by the lack of confidence as people needed their money back right away. I didn't see that in the others. Um, I, I, I'm often told that, you know, Lehman was not a commercial bank, and they're right. However, I think those investment banks, Bear Stearns and Lehman and even the others, were becoming more, more like banks as the, as the commercial banks became dominant in the investment banking business. So what you had was um, you got the rules changed where you could take a long-term asset, a mortgage, and you could use it in a repo against a short-term liability, and you were spinning that. So that became a deposit, essentially. And so when the crisis came, the liquidity ran. You have these assets. <laughs> so the, pro the problem is immediate. And I think that's, that's really what happened. They became more bank-like, but we, we didn't acknowledge that until the crisis. And then they were made banks, the ones that survived. I think there was another mistake made in that where I think we could have, I think we could have made a real difference. Now, it's, it's a counterfactual. I can't do anything with that. But... Bear Stearns was bailed out. I just don't understand it because it was relatively small investment bank. Drexel it wasn't bailed out. It failed, and we got through it fine, and there was a lesson learned. But we bailed it out, and that signaled to the market that Lehman's would be bailed out. It, it was under pressure. And so if you're, and then if you're a money fund, you know it's going to be bailed out. You're going to get a really great return. So you, you put your money there, and... Lo and behold, they aren't bailed out. So now no one knows what to do. The crisis has made so much worse. So let's be, number one, understand that Fidelity, BlackRock, so forth, are not banks. Those investors know what they're doing. They know they're going to get, if it goes south, they're going to get less than they had hoped for. Will that cause a panic? Depends on how much the banks are lending to them. Uh, that they'll take the loss. That's where you know you get the. That's where you get the systemic effect through the bank, and I think that's what we have to focus on. Um, I may be wrong on that, but I, I suspect, I, I, I feel pretty comfortable with that approach. So, yeah, right back here, Celia. Yes, Daryl. Thanks, uh, Tom. If uh, the various agencies that implement the Volcker Rule have different views about how to um, implemented going forward. What's the process by which the agencies get together and either reach the same conclusion, or is there some other way uh, that they implement it differently, one agency from the other? Yeah. Um, very good question, because it's almost like a legislative process, right? Uh, but we do have staff uh, that the, the agencies work through the staff originally, try and come to consensus, and then bring it to the so-called principles, and uh, hopefully come to a consensus. Now, one of the issues is, should you put rule writing in only one agency? Now, I will, this is personal opinion only, but my view is the Volcker rule should be simplified greatly, and that is 
no prop trading, and you can't own a hedge fund, all right? That's what the rule says. We expect you to, and we assume you're going to, and if we examine you and you're doing something else, we'll call you to it. We, you don't need this reams of paper. We presume you're in compliance unless we find evidence to the contrary. Get rid of all this other stuff. One other thing. I want the CEO to attest that they have policies and procedures in place and that they test them through internal audit and they're confident and they're willing to sign off on that. Now they're going to get serious. I don't need 15, you know, the only, I think this is still true. The only instance where we've found violations of the Volcker rule is when the CEO wouldn't attest. <laughs> That's great, okay? We expect you to obey, and they do, and they won't sign. Why do we need all this paper? And hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars go into collecting that data that's not useful. I could, I could do, uh, simplify it a lot. And so one of the debates I think will be in the legislation is whether you place rule writing in one agency and then the others carry it out. I, I think that's reasonable. I just, the one thing I would insist on is that you keep the attestation. Put your money where your mouth is or your signature and your livelihood. <laughs> We've got a question right over here. Oh, sorry. First, uh, hopefully you can Dr. Share. Honig, it seems yes. to oh. me that during the crisis and its aftermath, that there were, there was a trade-off and it seemed like the largest banks took, they said, we'll suffer more regulation as long as we don't have to raise equity capital. Right. And now we are in a more deregulatory environment and they don't want to do either. And I'm a, a, I'm a real pro-business guy, but I think that our, our own Professor Admati, who might even be here. Yeah, she's here in the back. Today. I mean, she, oh, there she is. She, you're going to hear My favorite professor. <laughs> um, that, that she was, you know, her work was criticized as being simplistic or impossible or impractical. But the fact of the matter is, is there's a trade-off now. Um, more, and it's sort of more of an observation, but I want to know, is there any possibility of trading less regulation for more equity capital? Yeah. Wonderful question. I, th there is, but it's, it's for the smaller banks. Uh, this re recent legislation uh, in the Senate proposed was a highly capitalized bank. So for smaller regional bank, for regional banks and smaller banks, if you had 10%, you got rid of the Basel capital requirements. You got rid of some of the uh, qualified mortgage things. You got simplified it a lot. The, the largest banks... Uh, in the House had a bill called the Choice Act, which said if you maintain 10%, then you get this. They didn't want that for 10%. <laughs> when you're at six, 10% is a long way to go. And uh, if you think about it, for all the issues around the resolution process and all the paper that's filed, and that's expensive, but think about how you affect your ROE by a one percentage point drop in the equity capital requirement, it, it swamps that. So I'm never, as a large bank, I'm never going to trade 10% for less regulation because I've operationalized it. I've simplified it into a process. I've learned how to read the regulator. Uh, and so I, I, I mean, I've read, <laughs> I've tried to read is a better way to describe it, the, the resolution plans. And they're, they're just... Just incomprehensible. Uh, and not, not, because, not because they're meaning to be that way, but these institutions are so complicated, you can't hope to really, I don't, I don't I'd be willing to bet their directors have no idea uh, what's involved in that. So I would be happy to trade it. I think the market, if it weren't for the, the wonderful subsidy that's there, the market would require more capital of them. In the crisis, the, the, the ratio that the market, I was told by the investment market, looked at was the tangible capital to asset. How much do you have before you're insolvent? That's the only question. And um, when they realized it was less than 3%, they got, they got worried. But I don't think it has much chance. Uh, okay, there and then Peter, or Peter. Peter. Uh, Dr. Honig, thanks for coming to Stanford. Sure. Um, Earlier in the discussion, you uh, uh, 
seem to indicate the investor knows approach is uh, uh, adequate for, 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 for capital markets. However, um, two things come to mind, and I'm curious your perspective. First is the, the, the financial crisis may have been caused by shadow banks, which are an investor knows concept. And second, last week or two weeks ago, uh, VIX products resulted in a fire sale of equity markets and sure. you know, many trillions of dollars of, of market capitalization went away. Um, can the government, uh, how do you think about the government's ability to attack that problem? Are there regulators thinking about this problem? And from a banking regulator point of view, does it matter or is it okay that if the markets can do whatever they want as long as the banks are okay, as a banking regulator, we shouldn't worry about it? I, I don't know how, how to, my personal view is, I, I do believe in markets. And I think, I think the market on its own, you know, it, there's no formula that it uses, but it, when it's willing to, how much, how much is it willing to invest depends on how much confidence it has in the institution. And that affects the cost of capital and so forth. And I think it would require more because if I'm a, cre if I'm a creditor or an investor and I think it's likely to go bust or if I'm a creditor and I know it doesn't matter if it goes bust, I'm going to get my money back, which I've been proven to me several times, the discipline is gone, right? So you, the, 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 the very self-confident CEO and team uh, can do some pretty risky things and they source the funds right there. So, so I just would, that's why I wanted prudential standards. I want the capital ratio to be something that I saw at least the market demand of them before you had the safety net so great. Then let the market work. And I don't, I don't think the government can write a resolution plan that will work. I'm not sure the bank can. Because if you have capital, you'll have time to default that you can try and get through and reorganize. And if not, it's more, to, more likely to, to be um, idiosyncratic than systematic. Now, not necessarily. I realize we've had crisis in our history before, uh, but at least the market is driving it. And I think the government comes in uh, to help the economy. It comes in to uh, mitigate the systemic consequences of, of those mistakes. I don't know that it has any choice, but I think it has to come in too soon now with such low levels of capital. So, Professor Admati. Hi, thank you. Uh, so you were in the Fed system for a while, and now you're in the FDIC. I think that, uh, you know, I, I'll try to draw out of you uh, agreeing to the, uh, what the Fed is and isn't doing that it's required to do under Dodd-Frank. For example, Title I actually gives them as, uh, as an entry point the living wills. Living wills were there to point to who can't fail through bankruptcy and whoever can't and the Fed can do whatever they want, break them up, more capital, all of that. Then you have the Senate saying, not some senators, bipartisan saying, getting everybody to agree to take away the subsidies, unanimous decision in, 19, in 2013. And Brown and Vitter, two odd pair of senators proposing something the Fed can do already. So there are a few, there's a list of failures on the part of the Fed that I think FDIT should F FDIC should scream about it, and I think you have been, but because it falls on you. I think before the crisis, Citigroup, which is our poster child of too big to fail, you know, bank, uh, bailed out numerous times over its history, <laughs> um, was insolvent except for the deposit right. bank. Right. Uh, and somehow now, you know, the, the, the Fed is in a position of uh, you know, dealing with the governance issues, saying, oh, you know, the boards are too burdened by matters requiring its, you know, attention, and we should, instead of using every symptom in the book to say something's really wrong with these institutions, Dodd-Frank told us to take care of that problem, 
And we are in charge of bank holding companies that are systemic, every institution that's systemic, and we know who the top six are. And the Fed is not really using that authority. Uh, can I get you to comment on that? Um, it's kind of a lot. <laughs> <laughs> can I have a drink of water first? <laughs> um, look, I, I think the, the Federal Reserve um, is the supervisor of the bank holding companies. And the Federal Reserve could uh, require that they hold more capital. I mean, that's one of the options that they have. But they are, who, whoever they are, but the Fed has uh, engaged. Now, remember, it's not just the Fed. They've engaged in this international process called Basel. Uh, Europe is far less. And then, so, so you have to worry, are you... Are you going to disadvantage? I know that's called competing to the bottom, I know. Uh, so those are all the, all the factors that are involved in there. But I've said we have the stronger capital. We're winning on the international front. We could do more, but I think it's unlikely. I think if we keep what we have now, given the, the boom times that we have, if I could just lever a little more, I could get my hedge fund returns of... 20% or 25 again, uh, those, are the, those are the counterweights to that. But I, I mean, they could, but I don't see it. I, uh, what I want them to do is not let it go back down to three, because <laughs> that is a prescription for a repeat. Whatever the source of the shock, it's hard to withstand with only that much capital. Remember, that's like a that's like building a 100-story tower with no foundation. I would like to use that terrible metaphor. <laughs> okay, on that note, why don't we wrap up? So please join me in thanking Dr. Hunt. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.